here at GP Providence. Hello and welcome to this round one of GP Providence. I'm Tim Willoughby, joined by Kenji Igashira, and it's Ixal Limited all the way here in Rhode Island. We have the team of Pat Cox, Ari Lax, and Craig Wisco, a number of Pro Tour winners there against Adam Snook, David Shields, and Matthew Costa. Matthew Costa just his fantastic time of it of late, uh, and these players just about to kick things off. Uh, we get a chance to see early starts here it's not a goblin bombardment uh, <laughs> to kick things off there for Matt Costa he it looks like we might have a, a black mirror on our hands here after a fashion yeah there's a makeshift munitions in the format which may be similar to goblin bombardment but uh, it looks like neither of these players are currently playing red Ari on the left there with that kite sail freebooter gonna take a look at Matt's hand yeah looking for non-creature non-lands to get from there yeah and you know matt actually has a bright reprisal and a cancel so two good options and those are really good cards to know about as well i think duress effects staple on creatures are, are quite solid all right now knowing that he might have to play around that bright reprisal later in the game shorekeeper the late game option was matt costa able to get little bit points of damage in early also Nice to have the early flyer for Arilax, though. Notable that at the moment he's representing being mono black. Looks like he's black red pirates as opposed to black blue or indeed red blue. A whole variety of different ways of, of putting those together. Dead Eye Tormentor there coming down for uh, Arilax. So he's keeping up this idea of uh, hand disruption. So he's already been able to take a look at Matt Costa's hand, snipe one card out of it. Dead Eye Tormentor, thanks to Raid, that 2 2 forcing another discard from Costa. Yeah, Dead Eye Tormentor, not a very strong card standalone if you don't have the raid trigger, but getting cards out of your opponent's hand, especially when you've already used, you know, one way to get a card is very, very strong. Now, question for you, Kenji. In terms of this format, we're seeing a fair amount of action on the first couple of turns here. Would you characterize this as an aggressive format or a more defensive one? I think it's definitely more aggressive. After playing, you know, quite a few matches, both sealed and draft, I think players are going to go more aggro, more tempo. You are definitely going to see some of those more expensive top end cards for sure but uh well as you can see here things things getting in the red zone very very quickly yeah the pirate cutlass there on dead eye tormentor forcing the block uh, and then trade ultimately there from matt costa yeah ari opted to equip the cutlass which can attack uh, equ equip to a pirate immediately when you cast it uh on his two two so that i could attack in to the shorekeeper there instead of equipping it to his one two flyer yeah skittering heartstopper there did get a death touch in order to establish the trade and Arilax follows things up pretty... Uh, uh, sorry, yeah, it is Arilax following things up pretty quickly there. Just creatures on the board every single turn, very low to the ground there. Dire Fleet Captain coming along the 2-2 that when it attacks, gets plus one, plus one for each other attacking pirate. Very strong pirate he theme here for Ari, and I think we're going to expect to see some fairly strong tribal themes across the day here. For sure. Shorekeeper, trial bite tribal, it started, I'm calling it. Well, there are many, many changelings in Magic's history, so... <laughs> but they weren't trilobites until Ixalan came this out. This is true, this is true. Nice little value play here from Matt. Vanquish the Weak taking care of the uh, Kaisel Freebooter, even though it had a Cutlass on it. He's going to get back his Cancel, so now Ari's going to have to kind of maneuver around that Cancel should Matt ever hold up two blue and one. And with treasure map in play, the longer this game goes on, the better things look for Matt Costa. He's going to be able to get some scrying going on and then at some point potentially transform that treasure map into treasure cove, at which point he gets to sacrifice treasure and draw cards. Right. A lot of these transform cards from Ixalan are super powerful, treasure map being one of them. Of course, paying one to scry doesn't seem amazing, but in a sealed format like this where you just want to hit specific cards, of course, that's great. And then on the transform side, oh, man, you get three treasures when it has three counters on it, and then you can tap and sacrifice a treasure to draw a card. Just amazing. Speaking of treasures, of course, the Dire Fleet Hoarder for Ari Lax uh, on the bottom of your screen. When it dies, it creates a treasure, 2-1 in the meantime. But right now, Matt Costa, the one that's able to get the treasure on board first. Contract killing working very, very nicely with what he's got going on with treasure map. Can you kind of see how the fight to see who got treasure map in his team went his way? Yeah, Matt getting those two treasures is going to be able to still use that treasure map at end of turn, transform it, and then have a total of four treasures that he can start cashing in one at a time. 
I kind of also like the fact that a lot of these transform cards, because they turn into lands, they kind of represent mana ramp in addition to everything else they have going on. Sure. They're a little bit slow in the, in the form of mana ramp, as it generally takes you quite a few turns to get to that point, but it's not something to be overlooked. I mean, at the moment, the biggest issue Matt Costa has is that Arilax, while none of his cards individually look too scary, they are doing a reasonable job of attacking his life title here, already down to 11. And he's going to have to try and deal with, I mean, ideally the Pirate's Cutlass, I guess, because it means that every creature that Arilax is drawing is actually a kind of a relevant threat here. Yeah, the Pirate's Cutlass is similar to a trusty machete from like the Zendikar uh, era, if you think about it, because it's three mana to play, but if you're immediately equipping it, that's basically the same cost as the trusty machete. And then, you know, just turning your smaller pirates or creatures in general into something that can attack into a larger threat, maybe even a shorekeeper here, even though that's not much of a threat, although it does have three toughness, just really lets the pirate deck go over the top sometimes. Yeah, Pirate's Cutler is actually one of the cards that I've seen break out of its tribal shackles, if yes. you will, because plus two plus one for any of the tribes that are slightly smaller, a pretty relevant amount of uh, extra punch for those creatures. So Matt Costa here, he's got his Treasure Cove transformed, he's got plenty of treasure, which means he can be casting multiple oh threats baby. in a turn. He just needs to get something going, and that's a big, big threat entering there. Dead Eye Plunderers gets plus one, plus one for each tr artifact you control. So that means that right now the 3-3 three, three is getting plus four, plus four. We have a 7-7 seven, seven on deck. <laughs> well, not only a 7-7, seven, seven, it's a 7-7 seven, seven that basically draws a card in, in conjunction with Treasure Cove. This is an amazing synergy Matt has here. He can produce a treasure for five mana, rather four mana, and then he can sacrifice that treasure to draw a card. Dust Legion Dreadnought, the follow-up from Ari Lax here, but right now he's the one with the smaller creatures on the table. He just needs to hope that he can leverage the fact that Matt Costa already on just seven life. Yeah, but even though Matt's on seven, he has firm control of the game. The Skittering Heartstopper can just stop the Dusk Legion in its tracks by giving itself Death Touch. He, of course, has that huge Deadeye Plunderers. And lo the longer the game goes, the more Matt is just going to pull ahead and ahead and ahead. Yeah, Treasure Cove just sat on board here, representing so many extra cards. And when you give a good player like Matt Costa a lot of extra cards, that a problem for just about <laughs> any opponent. Yeah, and you can see Ari here just forced to play vanilla 4-4. Doesn't get that uh, raid trigger from the arsonist. Yeah, it's, it's one of those ones that I think that he's not going to mind too much about not getting the raid trigger there because... It, of the raid triggers that are in this set, right. that a relatively low impact one, uh, coming along late enough in the game that it often means a sacrificed land. Yeah, especially when your opponent has multiple treasures. The treasures represent extra cards, though. It's, it, that is true, but <laughs> Matt has enough mana to just keep spending them out. And you can see there, he, end of turn, sacked a treasure, drew a card, and then produced another one. He's just got pockets full of treasure. Yes. He's doing much plundering here. Good, good uh, flavor value here, the plunderers and the treasure cove. Oh, yeah. Not just a good synergy. Yeah, Matt Costa in full-on Scrooge McDuck mode at this point. Mm -hmm. And remember, Ari knows that Matt has a cancel in his hand from that Kite Self reboot earlier. Yeah, it, it's, it's been sat there for a long time, but Ari will definitely be aware of it. Uh, you don't win a Pro Tour without being cognizant of some of this sort of thing. And yeah, this is not the time that you want to be throwing <laughs> down two ones. I guess that this is the dark side of trying to be the really aggressive deck right. is that if it happens that someone can stop your early offense, you might not have quite so much going on. Yeah, and this is what Ari needs to do at this point in the game. I think he needs to play smaller threats that Matt might not counter, kind of go wide and hope to finish off the last seven points of damage. I think I see an unfriendly fire in Ari's hand too, so he might be uh, trying to get Matt to tap out at some point, maybe sack a treasure. Uh, and then produce another one and get him, you know, while he's tap low. But the problem is the treasures themselves will yeah. be used to fuel that cancel in Matt's hand. So it's going to be hard for, for Ari here. I think Matt is just, again, firmly in the driver's seat. I mean, Unfriendly Fire, a nice one. We can see it on, on the uh, screen there. The fact that it goes to the head is right. something that's a little bit unusual. We don't necessarily always see from uh, this sort of instant speed removal. And that means that Potentially, I mean, he knows how many other burn spells he had in his deck. He might have a, a second pass to victory, mm -hmm. even if it works out that the ground is very much being stalled by uh, Matt Costa's creatures. Well, treasure all the way for Matt Costa there. Just keeps things going. I think that we've determined that you don't have to be aggressive in this format. Right. Uh, and Matt Costa putting on a show here in terms of just keeping things slow and steady, but potentially winning this race. Yeah, Sailor of Means. Basically just drawing a card. Treasure with Treasure Cove. And 
a 1-4 for 3 is kind of ideal for his game plan anyway before you worry about the treasure, but the treasure obviously juicing up that game quite a bit. I think Sailor of Means is another underrated card in this format. There are so many two power, three power cards um, that come in early, and you know Sailor of Means as three, at three mana, just a good horned turtle, basically. Well, this is an interesting bait card here from Arilax. Plays a second copy of Pirate's Cutlass. That means that he does have the potential, even, <laughs> even though there's a gigantic plunderers <laughs> on the other side of the battlefield, to make a relevant attacking threat here. Um, looks like Cancel not being deployed on that one. Well, I think I see another Dead Eye Plunderers in Matt's hand. All right, a Cutlass in each hand for that Arsonist. Dual Wield coming in. Yeah, but I mean, with the Heart Stabber, a Heart Stopper on the other side, it's, it's just, it doesn't look that great. Yeah. If maybe Ari's creature had Trample, sure, but Matt can just jump in front of it with the 1-2, give it Death Touch, trade, still draw a card end of turn, still make a treasure at end of turn. The funny thing is, he has the Shorekeeper on the battlefield, but he might not even want to ever use that 8 mana to crack it. It's better as a defender here since he has such better, better ways to draw. An embarrassment of riches here for Matthew Costa in, in a more literal sense a literal, than you often yes, see. Absolutely. The trade secured there. And Arilax, he had to get something going sooner or later. I mean, that's kind of the cool thing about um, the, the little skittering monster is it does mean, like, sooner or later you just have to right. make a trade that you don't want to with it because otherwise it's just going to end up stopping your entire game plan if you're trying to be an aggressive deck. But, at, you know, when you're trading your five drop for a one drop, and your opponent's already so far ahead on cards, it's kind of resignation almost that uh, he's just trying to f push through in any way he can. Yeah, the one-mana creatures that gain Death Touch, they've kind of become a little bit of a more of a fixture in Limited. You mm -hmm. see them in most Limited sets now, uh, one or two-mana Death Touches, and they really do give Black a way of being defensive if it wants to, or just having a creature that you really don't want to block. Right. Queen's Agent revealing another Queen's Agent. Queen's Agent, an interesting one. A lot of the Explore cards that cost more are not quite as exciting to me because the, the draw isn't as big a deal in that stage of the game. But Queen's Agent, a 4-4 with lifelink here, representing a fairly sizable body on this board. And, of course, if Matt Costa gets to go from 7 to 11, it's, prob I mean, it's probably lights out anyway, but, you know. Well, if he's going from 7 to 11, I think uh, he's going to slurpee up this victory. Oh, Vraska's Contempt there revealed. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Some more life gain. Yeah, you know, again, Matt has pulled far enough ahead, and Ari just wasn't able to put that pressure that he needed, and now this game is effectively over for, for Ari. Now, the cool thing, of course, about the fact that we're playing teams is that even when these guys finish, we're going to have plenty of magic to bring you from this exact match. Craig Wesco already a game up against Dave Shields. Adam Snook already a game up against Pat Cox. So relatively close wow, in yeah. terms of the overall match, even if it works out that right now uh, Matt Costa is kind of running away with it a little bit here on the middle table of these three matches going on between these two teams. I just love seeing decks like Matt. Uh, decks like Matt, or Matt's deck, rather, <laughs> performing this well. Yeah, I mean, feasibly, the way that Matt Costa's deck loses is something happening early on that means that it's not quite going to work out. Once we get to this stage of the game, one has to think that he's got a lot of things sewn up. There's that contempt. Yeah, he had to reveal it from the Explore, so it's not as if uh, Ari didn't know it was there. Once the control deck starts attacking, pff, troubles. Yeah, it's not like Ari's completely out of it. I mean, he knows Matt has the cancel, of course, but if he can just draw a few runner-runner spells, we know he has that unfriendly fire. If he can somehow maneuver, well, that's that then. Yeah. Matt Costa starts attacking. Ari Lax pretty quickly starts scooping up his cards. <laughs> so that game one going to Matt Costa, and we're going to get a chance to jump across to one of our other games that are going on here in the match between uh, Team Cox, Lax, and Wesco versus Snook Costa and Shields. These players, they end up having slightly more effective sideboards because they have to split the entire pool. But we're going to chance to see Pat Cox against Adam Snook here. Not a massive surprise to see that there's white is ultimately gone for Craig Wesco in between these uh, 
players on the left. Pat Cox, though, he is on Merfolk, and we talked a little bit about the potential for uh, a kind of a Voltron plan almost uh, for the Merfolk deck, and it looks like that may have played out here. Meanwhile, Adam Snook on the other side of things, blue-white. Yeah, you don't normally see blue-white in this format, as it's not like a coherent tribal sy synergy here, but it looks like he has nice evasive creatures. We can see that Kinjali Sunwing, which uh, is really nice at keeping you aggressive because if your opponent plays a creature, it's just going to enter tapped. Vine Shaper Mystic, though, has meant that there's a bunch of plus one, plus one counters on Pat Cox's creatures. It means that we've got a good old-fashioned race on our hands here, 10 to 11, and the, the Merfolk deck, it can be kind of tempo-centric because it's got a lot of ways of interacting with your opponent's creatures, but also making it difficult for your opponent to block. Uh, all you need to do is find a few ways of either flying or indeed having unblockable creatures. In this exact matchup, the flying not looking quite so exciting because there are so many flyers for right. the blue-white deck. But a lot of these blue merfolk do have unblockability. Absolutely. Uh, and as, as this is game two, you can actually see in Pat's graveyard, he has two of the canopies. Yeah. Crushing canopy to kill the, uh, the flyers. And I, I think I see a bishop soldier plus one with the wind in Adam's graveyard. So that was a nice little blowout there in favor of Pat Cox. But he's still getting beaten down here. Yeah, Storm Sculptor is able to attack unblockably, and you see it doing exactly that there. Four damage coming through thanks to the plus one, plus one counter. And let's see what the follow-up is here. Yeah, immediately just throwing down a whole bunch of Merfolk, but because of that Sunwing, we do see that they're just coming into play tapped, and that meaning that the race may still go in Adam Snook's favor here. Yeah, this, the uh, Kanjali Sunwing kind of acting like a Tempest Caller yeah. in this instant. Tempest Caller, a big way mm -hmm. of breaking open stalls. Not really something that the blue-green the blue deck needs to end up worrying about too much. It has no. so many ways of uh, pushing through blockers. Yeah, Kamina's Speaker, Shaper Apprentice for Pat's side. But yeah, like you mentioned, they're tapped and he had to leave back that Mystic. Even though Adam has effectively three unblockable creatures here. The Vine Shaper Mystic, a real powerhouse, uh, coming down as a 1-3 three for 3 mana, but putting a plus one plus one counter on each of up to two Merfolk you control. So, worst case scenario, it's a 3 mana 2-4, which is not exciting, but not embarrassing. Uh, and then, if you've got any other Merfolk in play, then it does a whole lot. And that's before you start worrying about the fact that there are various ways in blue of picking up and playing it once more. Yeah, I think it's just a premium uncommon for the merfolk deck and even not in the merfolk deck like you mentioned you can still play it as a, a fine three mana two four and a surprising amount of the green creatures do end up being merfolk exactly. so it's, it's not hard to end up with a couple of merfolk in your deck so big swings coming in here from adam snook chooses to uh is he going to be using the unblockability here i think yes, he must he do yeah so daring saboteur are gonna get in the red zone as well five damage knocking pat down to five and the uh the daring is gonna let adam loot so more Looting nice feels very appropriate for Ixalan. Uh, these, these pirates, they know how to get some loot going. Looting, of course, meaning drawing and then discarding a card. Right, right. <laughs> Named after Merfolk Looter, who conspicuously not in this set. Um, I guess it gets a little bit messy on your flavor when <laughs> pirates are the ones doing the looting and Merfolk are around, but they're kind of trying to protect the treasures of Ixalan. We do have rummagers, though. The rummaging goblin in red. Yeah. All right. Good old-fashioned race here. And... Doesn't take too much to throw this plan off. I like it. So there we had, I couldn't quite see the trick that was being played by Adam Snook on that side of things. He put it just at the top of our screen. Looks but like a depth. Yeah, the, the big one there really to keep things going and keep things safe was on the other side, dive down in order to give hexproof and plus three toughness. So basically countering the spell from Adam Snook, that meaning that Pat Cox was just able to stay in that race. Yeah. Dive down one of those cards that on the face of things I mean, it, it doesn't help you kill anyone, so it looks like it doesn't help you win the game. But when your plan is very much having some key threats and keeping them alive and, and killing people with them, it kind of does win you the game in a funny sort of way. I think it's great versus blue-white, too. I mean, we can imagine that Adam probably has access to run aground or pious interdiction, Ixalan's binding, these type of effects where, you know, at one mana, you can just counter any of those cards. So here we have Craig Wesco on the left of our screen. He of the love of every kind of aggro white deck and actually a great player to have on your team limited team because having someone that specializes in something and is is really comfortable playing a particular style of play in team sealed you know that you can have a deck that's going to work well for that that player and here craig wesco already a game up against dave shields dave currently 
mono green. <laughs> I'm guessing that that's not going to pan out for too l terribly long. But he's up against vampires here uh, alongside Skittering Heartstopper, who is an honorary vampire for now, and indeed that Aerosaur that is coming along. So team black and white, no tribal synergies of any great note, but all of these creatures pretty efficient. Yeah, funny enough, uh, Craig only has one vampire on the battlefield, just the bishop's soldier. He's got an insect, he's got a human squire or human uh, soldier, and he also has the dinosaur, so... <laughs> Everyone's teaming up here. Meanwhile, Dave Shields stuck on mana. I, I guess one of the cool things about team limited formats is that even if you happen to have some slightly shaky mana draws, at least you know that that variance gets sort of panned out a little bit um, between the three matches that are going on, so you, c you can potentially get past having a shaky draw as long as your teammates don't have one at the same time, for sure. And that one of the reasons, I guess, that we see that the best teams in Team Limited so consistently finishing at the top of the standings in events like this one. I think I see a Hotly in uh, David Shield's hand that he was unable to cast. I think he also had a Crushing Canopy, which was able to kill the Shining Arrow Store, but he played a 1-4 instead, which effectively blocks it. Yeah, Wesco here. Maybe having to pump the brakes just a touch, but life total's 24 to 13 for him. Already a game up, kind of where he wants to be. Let's see if Craig has a way to push through some damage here. He can't offer the Heartstopper a way for either of these creatures, but I think Dave would be happy to block with a 2-2 in this particular scenario. Pretty free attack from Craig with the flyer at any rate. Yeah, unfortunately for Dave, that uh, Archer unable to kill any of Craig's creatures with the fight mechanic staple onto it. Yeah, and Whatley, Warrior Poet, a long way off getting cast for, by David Shields there. This is game two, so I'm guessing that Craig Wesco has a bit more of a feel for what could be languishing in Shields' hand. Doesn't really need to worry about it for now, though, as he just gets to continue laying down threats. A big one coming down there for him. 4-4 four, four Flyer that is just going to keep on coming back. Deathless Ancient. Uh, you can tap three untapped va uh, vampires to return it from your graveyard to your hand. So if you end up in a mid to long game, you are able to just keep on throwing that 4-4 into the red zone. Not too many things that can uh, beat it in a fight in the air. Yeah, in limited Deathless Ancient as a six mana 4-4 four, four Flyer would still be fine on its own, but then it has the relevant creature type of vampire, and it can also, you know, be gotten back from the graveyard should you have three vampires later on. So just a very solid card. And it looked like I saw a couple of copies of Territorial Hammer Skull in uh, Craig Wesco's hand. They're great for punishing uh, an opponent that's had a slightly tricky start. Mm -hmm. uh, when they attack in, the two threes do tap down a creature. And, well, a couple of them mean that effectively David Shields rendered unable to block anything. Yeah, Territorial Hammer Skull might be the best white common in the set. It just does so much work. As a three mana two three, it already blocks or trades with many of the creatures on the same casting cost. And then it just lets you do so much on offense. Oh, and Vanquish the Week here on uh, the Atzikin Archer. Yeah, Vanquish the Week. One of those removal spells that sometimes gets stuck in your hand frustratingly, but when it doesn't, very potent indeed. Big swings coming in here from Craig Wesco, and it may be that uh, we're seeing the team of Cox, Lax, and Wesco picking up their first match win pretty shortly here. All right, there's that Crushing Canopy. Going to be a nice trick here to take care of that 4-4. Four, four. Yeah, I'm going to call Crushing Canopy is probably one of the most important sideboard cards that we're going to see here this weekend. There's always going to be a home for it, and when it comes in, it's just super impactful. Absolutely. There are enough enchantments and flying creatures in the format that I, I even think you can main deck it a lot of the time. We were talking earlier about, like, Pious Interdiction, Ixalan's Bindings. You can hit things like New Horizons, and then just, again, plenty of flyers in the format that it also deals with. I mean, the interesting one for me on it is there's a one from the one, uh, one with the wind in play. Mm. You get you can either get your two for one, <laughs> or you can get rid of the enchantment and then just block if you maybe wanted to get uh, a little bit of synergy within rage. Sure, absolutely. David Shields here. It's, he's finally found the red mana, but it may be too little, too late here for him. Throws down another archer in the hope of being able to get some blocks on. Yeah, and just this archer has not looked good, even though Dave has two of them. I think there are good cards, but. Just no X ones on the battlefield, no enraged synergies right now. He doesn't have a pump trick in response to the trigger. And a lightning strike.
coming down here, but we see the pump spell in oh. response, and that enough for the handshake. So Dave Shields and Craig Wesco, their match is now finished. Craig Wesco winning that one. Both of these players now, they get the opportunity to... Well, I mean, they have this opportunity the whole way through, right. but it's a bit easier once you're no longer playing. They can lean across. They're sat next to Ari Lax and Matt Costa, and if either of those players wants a little bit of help and advice, you know, they can certainly give it. Uh, that's part of the joy of team formats. If you've got a decision that you think is really tough, maybe whether or not you want to keep your opening seven or similar, you can ask a teammate for a second opinion. Yeah, and we'll probably see these players shuffle around now. So Adam Snook against Pat Cox. So the characteristics of this matchup is it's a lot about the air. Um, we see uh, Pterodon Knight in play for Adam Snook. That can gain flying if it works out that Snook can find himself a dinosaur. Looks like there is one in hand for him here. Ooh, the, the Kinjali Sunwing once again. Kinjali Sunwing so powerful in a race. The 2-3 flyer that means that creatures coming into play tapped on Pat Cox's side of the board. Oh, wow. That's what we like. Daring Saboteur coming down for Adam Snook as well. So he has his game plan fully assembled. Meanwhile, Pat Cox, he's on the blue-green Merfolk plan that is trying to kind of play a bit of a tempo game, but it may be that he's just got kind of a bad matchup here in this round one. Yeah, he's trying to be the aggressor as Merfolk usually go low to the ground. I mean, he has the river sneak, but it's so bad on defense. Yeah, river sneak, the two-mana 1-1. One, one. It's unblockable, and it does get plus one, plus one whenever a Merfolk comes into play under your control, but that obviously favors attacking rather than blocking. And right now, you can't even really block most of the main threats that Adam Snook has deployed to this battlefield. Yeah, the only upside for Pat is if he has a Windstrider to flash in, as that is a merfolk to, to buff up the, the River Sneak. But even then, it only becomes a 2-2. Two -two. Yeah, and at the moment, he also just has a Tishana's Wayfinder in play, notably without a plus one plus right. one counter. So he got, he got to draw a card. It was a land. Um, but... A 3-3 might have been kind of more what he was after here. Oh, here we go. One of the most powerful rares in this format, Vanquisher's Banner. Yeah, Vanquisher's Banner. So you choose a creature type. I'm guessing we're going to see Merfolk here from Pat Cox. Uh, creatures you control uh, of the chosen type get plus one plus one, and then whenever you cast a, a creature of that type, draw a card. So if Pat Cox can untap and kind of go off a little bit, effectively he's got Glimpse of Nature in play plus Crusade in play for his team. Yeah, now a long, long game would probably favor Pat as he's just going to be able to, you know, every time he plays a Merfolk, chain through his library. But Adam is already so far ahead on board. He has a 3-3 flyer, a 2-3 flyer, a 2-1 that he can make unblockable, and Pat is down 5 life in the race already. So an attack for 2 here, unblockable from Pat Cox. It's not going to be blocking, so it might as well be attacking. But Adam Snook just looking to put these away. Vanquisher's Banner, another interesting one in terms of Team Sealed, because I'm guessing that there will be a bunch of decks that are using Tribal Synergies that could quite happily use a Vanquisher's Banner. So it ends up being a bit of a bun fight between the various <laughs> players on the team in terms of who gets to play that banner. Uh, I guess that one of the things that swings it maybe for Merfolk is the fact that they can play multiple threats in a turn more easily than something like Dinosaurs. Absolutely. If that's their top end card, then should they just find another Merfolk later on, they're able to continuously chain. Because I think one problem with the Merfolk deck, while it does have a ton of synergy and you can go, you mentioned earlier, kind of boggles uh, buffing them up, they run out of gas pretty quickly, usually, as all your creatures are two mana, three mana, so... All right, Pat Cox down to eight here on attacks from Adam Snook, who does get to get that loot off his... Uh, the Daring, yep. Yeah, and another vampire coming down. Two lifelink vampires on D. Um, at the moment, the River Sneak is the only real attacker for Pat Cox <laughs> anyway, so it's not really too much of a worry. The biggest thing for Pat is he's on eight life here, facing down a sizable force. His creatures are coming into play tapped. At okay. least he's getting to draw cards when he plays them, though. That's actually a really good one here for Pat. That, that Shaper's Apprentice... Oh, well, the Kinjali Sunwing, of course, making all of Pat's creatures enter tap. But the Sun... Or the, rather, the Shaper's Apprentice is a 3-2 flyer because of the Vanquisher's Banner. Yeah, it trades very nicely against something like that Pterodon Knight. Yeah, Hol I think holds off the Sunwing. Absolutely. I think something... One of the cards that could pull back Pat in this game is like a River's Rebuke, the six-mana return all non-land permanence your opponent's control to its owner's hand. Yeah, that one... I found that when I'm playing against it and my opponent uses it if I'm way ahead, it doesn't feel that bad. Sure. But, I mean, certainly, yes, it'll buy him some time. And with a Vanquisher's Banner in play, he does have the potential to use that time in a useful way. 
American Jolly Sunwing just super gross here for Adam. Pat really wanting that creature to enter untapped, of course. Worth noting that Matt Costa won his game two, so this is 1-1. Okay. This is our last uh, game of the match. Really, really close uh, between these two players. Yeah. Something to note on the Vanquisher's banner. It is not a plus one, plus one counter. It's just static. Plus one, plus one for your creatures. Yeah, means that the creatures you already have in play, they're doing just fine. And the creatures you play afterwards, well, they're loving it because oh, yeah. you get to draw a card in addition to them just being bigger. So Adam Snook here, he's, he's pretty patient on this. I don't think he's going to mind too much waiting around to try and figure out uh, if uh, Cox has a way out of this one. Well, as you mentioned, the players almost certainly consulting their two teammates as they are both finished now. Yeah, it's something that's not uncommon to see in team formats that, you know, maybe the first game uh, goes fairly fast. Uh, the second match might go a little slower. When it comes down to the wire, especially here, round one, no one likes to start their tournament off no. with a loss. Um, each of these players getting a few extra insights from uh, their teammates, though. Speaking to a lot of teams, they kind of say, whoever's in the driver's seat, we let them drive because they're the ones that know the cards the best in their deck. They've got the most experience of what's going on in the matchup. And it just means that you don't end up getting into this sort of horrible situation where <laughs> no one can actually uh, make decisions because you've got so many voices in the conversation. Herald of Secret Streams coming down there for Pat Cox. Coming into one plus one counters would be unblockable. Unfortunately, you know, for the people in chat that were thinking that maybe Vanquisher's banner created plus one plus one counters, that synergy, not a thing that really works out here. But as things stand, Adam Snook able to get things closed out. Uh, anyway, lovely bit of tempo from Adam Snook able to take down that game against what I would have described as one of the better looking tempo decks in the format. For sure. And surprisingly in a blue white deck too, not necessarily as many tribal synergies you expect, although we did see the Pterodon Knight with the Kinjali Sunwing to, to kind of do some work there. But Pious Interdiction, you know, going to remove one of Pat's two creatures left to block, and that'll finish it off. So two matches going to the team of Snook, Costa, and Shields. This is the, the nice thing for Shields. He faced Craig Wesco's deck that looked like kind of a monster. He lost to it. Didn't matter. Yep. Uh, the rest of the team picking up the wins needed in that round one for it all to go to Snook, Costa, and Shields. And you can see that on the other side of things, we have got two matches in our feature match area. We're going to get a chance to see a little bit more magic from this round one soon enough. Looks like we are getting... Well, there's a judge call going on. We, we're not going to be watching this from the point that we are now right. we're gonna get a chance to see a time walked match effectively now just so you guys at home know how that works essentially we've had our cameras rec recording for the entire time we're gonna get a chance to start from the beginning of our match on the left hand side soon enough right after these messages
Hello and welcome back to GP Providence. I'm Tim Willoughby here with Kenji Igashira. We've already had our first match in the books here in round one and it was a doozy, but you know what? Our feature match area has two matches going on at any given moment. Two matches that represent actually six matches, I guess, right. in the feature match area. And we're going to get a chance to see, well, one of the powerhouse teams in this tournament up against, well, one of the old timers of Magic who's kind of come back to see how he can get on here in Providence. Let's head back down to our feature match area for our time walk match. So we have Paolo Vitor Damodar de Rosa. That one next to his name means that he's the number one ranked player in the world right now after having just won a Pro Tour. Eric Froelich and Ben Stark, arguably one of the best <laughs> teams in the entire tournament. Up against Zach Hill, Ryan Sachs, and Hayden Bedzol. Zach Hill, formerly of coverage and indeed working at Wizard of the Coast in R&D. Back for this one, he's come across and quick start for uh, Paolo against Zach Hill here. We have, well, it looks like some variation on red, which we know that Paolo likes at the moment, what with his Pro Tour win, up against uh, black-white for Zach Hill. And Zach, characteristically for him, described his deck as gas. However, Fe Fleet Fathom Firebrand, the tongue twister herself, uh, two copies of that coming down for Paolo Vittor Damodarosa, and they can represent some pretty potent attackers, even in the mid to late game. Yeah, I think that's just one of the best two drops in this format, and that's saying something because there are so many powerful twos. Like, in the early game, you're fine trading it off with another two drop. In the late game, it can trade up a lot of the time, and Paulo here on three red means he can activate it, you know, multiple times should he hit enough mana. Zach Hill there, playing Legion Conquistador, finding a couple more copies of it uh, for his subsequent turns. It's kind of the uh, Grey, over gra Grey Ogre Ground Powder <laughs> version of Squadron Hawk, but you know what? Squadron Hawk was great, so no complaints there. Yeah, the vampire synergy on the Conquistador is, is quite good. Um, I mean, you're not super thrilled with a what they call a Grey Ogre, right? The 2-2 two, two for 3, but if you're finding more copies of it, absolutely, and Zach apparently has at least 3 in his deck. Yeah, I mean, it's the sort of thing you don't necessarily have to search out all of them when you first play them, but it doesn't hurt. But uh, he's not the only one with multiple copies of things because on the other side of things, Palo Vitor Damarosa did just cast a Brazen Buccaneers and on his Explore revealed another copy of Brazen Buccaneers. And you know what? 3-3 three, three Hasters for 4 mana, perfectly serviceable rate. Yeah, and it, it even attached to a Scry when you hit it as a 3-3, three, three, so effectively a Scry at any rate. Um, I'm not too fond of that card, as if it's 4 mana for a 2-2 two, two Haste, you're not too happy about it, but a 3-3 three, three Haste for 4, when you're the aggressor, you're already up on board, that's perfectly fine. And Paladin of the Bloodstained there coming along for Zach Hill. The 3-2 uh, for 4, but it does bring a 1-1 one, one lifelinking uh, vampire along with. So we're getting value all over the place in a variety of different ways here from the, uh, the two decks being played here. All the more explore from Palo Vitor. Yeah, Palo of the Bloodstain, I think, a little bit underrated. Um, four mana, three, two, that produces a one, one lifelink vampire is actually quite solid in this format. It's just super annoying. And you get the double vampire synergies in case you have something like Anointed Deacon or Bishop of the Bloodstain, etc. And the Vampires is the deck that typically we're most expecting to see go wide. So it's, it's going to try and get lots of creatures on the battlefield and push through damage simply by having more attackers and blockers than what's going on on the other side of things. And here's Zach. He's able to trade off a little bit more because we know that he's already getting extra uh, creatures in play. He's got the extra Legion Conquistadors mm -hmm. that effectively free draws for him uh, from his deck. He's not going to run out of cards in hand anytime soon. He just want to hit it. Here's his land drop so he can start playing Spell Spell. Yeah, wow, we can see Zach has full grip of spells in hand. It's, it's really going to be on Paulo to, to push this game because if Zach's able to go too wide, then Paulo's smaller creatures are just not going to be doing too much. Versus something like Dinosaurs, where Zach might hope to play like a 4-4 four, four or a 5-5 five, five to stabilize, Paulo would be able to attack in with the, the Fathom Fleet Firebrand and potentially trade it. But here, you know, if, he, if Zach just plays one of his other Legion Conquistadors, I think uh, Paulo's going to be unhappy to trade away with that. Yeah, Zach, I spoke to him just before this match started, and he described the team on the other side of the table as being an end boss team. <laughs> we have three Hall of Famers, one of them fresh off his second Pro Tour win, uh, and yeah, the number of Pro Points on uh, the team on the left of our screen, Damodarosa, Frolic, and Stark, is staggering. Uh, meanwhile, Zach Hill's team with uh, Ryan and Hayden, he actually refers to himself as the player that's most out of practice on his team, but equally he's the one with the highest ceiling on how he's finished at the Pro Tour thus okay. far. But this, if you're looking for a way of warming up, oh, no. this, is, this is kind of going straight into the marathon. Uh, 
more Paladin of the Bloodstain. So just getting plenty of creatures on the battlefield. And Palo, it looks like he could kind of do with just getting a, a sizable threat on the board so that he can at least attack in and potentially kill off a couple of creatures in one fell swoop. The problem is I see a, a bunch of nice cards in Zach's hand. He has a Glorifier of Dusk if he wants to get that pseudo uh, Sarah Angel Vampire on the battlefield. I believe I saw an Ixalan's Binding to deal with any larger threat that Paulo might play here. And even though Paulo has walked the plank, it just doesn't look good versus the vampires that are trying to go wide. He also does not have his second black source, so typically mana issues in two color decks shouldn't be too big, but it does work out that uh, if you have double costs, sometimes that's a real cost that you, you have to contend with. So Palo Vitor, Damodorosa here, just having to content himself with just throwing down pretty much vanilla 2-2s. Diafleet Captain, yes, it can attack as a 4-4 because there's a couple of other uh, pirates in play, but Zach Hill, he can just throw a vampire under the bus <laughs> and really doesn't mind too much. Uh, Palo would really love to see some sort of way of evening up the score a little bit in terms of card advantage here. Right now, he's kind of on the back foot, uh, needs something to kind of turn that around. Yeah, unfortunately for the Dire Fleet, it's, just, it's not good on defense. It's basically a bear there, and you have to attack with other pirates to make that trigger happen. So unless Paulo wants to attack in with more creatures, he only has a 2-2 attacking. I mean, I would love to see at some point from Palavitor Damodorosa a fiery cannonade. Oh, yes. Two damage to each non-pirate oh. creature would be exactly what he needs on this sort of a, a board in order to be able to really get something going. And I think that's one of just the best uncommon sideboard cards you can have in a format like this. It is amazing versus half of the tribes versus merfolk and vampires. As you can see on this board right here, it cleared four of Zach's creatures. And at instant speed as well. Absolutely. Often that's the sort of effect you'd associate with a sorcery, but... Uh, yeah, the Fiery Cannonade, very potent if Palo Vitor Damodorosa has it. It's pretty co I'm pretty confident if it was in the pool, it will be in Palo Damodorosa's uh, at least uh, sideboard, possibly even main deck. Mm -hmm. And Palo here trading off for the Bloodstained. So he wants to be aggro, but he's trading off his creatures here because he just needs to get some of Zach's critters off the board. But <laughs> here we go. <laughs> Conquistadors, they just keep on a coming. Now, for you, uh, obviously, if you only had one copy of Legion Conquistadors, not a very exciting card to include in your deck. How many do you need to have before you're in incentivized to play it, should we say? Is, sure. is two good enough? I think two, you're wavering. It depends if you have any better you know, 22nd, 23rd, 24th cards that you could run. I think at three, though, the, the value is certainly there, especially in Sealed. Uh, you can expect some of these games to go a little bit more grindy. Yeah, the first 10 damage for Paolo Vittor Damodorosa, he was able to get through comparatively easy. But you know what? The second 10, I think he might struggle. Yeah, Zach, again, just going super wide here. That cannonade would be awesome if uh, Paolo had access to it. And this, of course, the very early days of the format. Literally, the set came out yesterday. So this is the best time to have a deck full of combat tricks because there's at least the potential that your opponents haven't quite figured out uh, what holding mana open might represent for them. Uh, maybe they can remember the commons, but they miss a rare or an uncommon here and there. Um, and you can bet that the top teams in this format, one of the things that they will be bringing to the table that uh, other teams might not is a better awareness of what they might need to play around. Taking a look at uh, Apollo's deck list here. No fiery cannonade. Sad faces for the Hall of Famer, but you know what? I'm sure he can find other ways out of this situation that he finds himself in. I mean, one thing that he does have going for him is that Zach Hill is really not presenting a huge amount of a clock uh, right now. Zach's all about the defense and just hoping that he can kind of gradually accumulate advantage from a whole bunch of uh, small edges. So, right, so two three threes attacking from Paulo's side. Zach just making, you know, a... a a trade block, effectively, if this would resolve. Any tricks from Palo Vitor Damodorosa at all here will be enough to secure a one and a half for one, I want to say, because he's getting rid of a token there in the process. Does use Vanquish the Weak on the Vampire token, simply because that's the one with lifelink. Uh, wants to get that out of the way before uh, any damage resolves. Ah, but is it really a one for 1.5 when that Conquistador was gotten by another one? 
Oh, counting card advantage. It gets complicated, guys. <laughs> Feel free to sound off in the chat in terms of cards for cards there and let us know your opinions. Very happy to have you all joining us here on this release day for uh, Ixalan. Is worth checking out whether or not there are local stores near you running release events at some point this weekend. So Zach trying to figure out what he wants to do here. Worth noting that this is, of course, just one match of three. It looks like thus far in the uh, round one time walk that we've got going on here, uh, we have a whole bunch of uh, bits and pieces going on. Uh, no games over just yet. There we are. Glorifier of Dusk for Zach Hill. That yeah. Sarah Angel-esque vampire we were talking about. It's so funny because Sarah Angel naturally has both flying and vigilance. And while technically Anointer of Dusk can gain uh, both of those, um, sorry, Glorifier of Dusk can gain both of those abilities, it's going to cost two life a time to get either of them. And that means that Zach is probably going to work out being very careful as to when he wants to gain either ability. Especially since... Knowing Paul, Paulo is playing red, access to things like Lightning Strike, Dark Nourishment, and uh, even Unfriendly Fire, which can all go to the dome. Yeah, and 7 life means that he's not got too many activations to work with, even if he wanted to go aggro with it. But Paolo here with one of the less exciting late gamer uh, plays of, of the event, throwing down two ones on this turn of the game, not exactly where you want to be, even if they do produce treasure when they die off. Dire Fleet Hoarder there, the 2-1 in question. Yeah, Paulo not in a terrible spot. We do know Zach has still many relevant spells in his hand, but paulo has been stuck on 4 for a while, and you mentioned not access to that double black yet, so once he hits another swamp, he might be able to, say, walk the plank, the glorifier, maybe press the advantage. His creatures are pretty good versus all but that glorifier. Oh, but this is brutal, Tim. Yeah, Mark of the Vampire. There's a number of different enchantments in this set that give plus two, plus two an ability. Mark of the Vampire might be the best of all of them. Plus two, plus two, and lifelink. Now we have a reason to think that we might see some life, life being paid here to give that Glorifier of Dusk abilities because he's going to get to win all that life back. Yeah. So vampires have this nice synergy going on in between themselves. Some have a lot of these pay life options. A lot of them have lifelink or, as you know, Mark of the Vampire... Uh, suggests other ways to gain life in this. Yeah, the, the Black-White Tribe, the, the the story behind it is basically the higher level vampires of Ixalan feeding on the blood uh, of <laughs> various members of their tribe in order to extend their life. But ultimately, everyone on Ixalan looking out for the, the hidden city of gold where there might be a true way of having eternal life. And Paolo Vittor and Amorosa here, watching the life total swing around. Suddenly he's at 9 and Zach Hill at 11. It could be lights out for the Brazilian Hall of Famer in this game one. Worth noting that Eric Froelich has picked up his game one against Ryan Sachs. And while it does say that Ben Stark picked up game one against Hayden Bedsall, I believe that that's actually a, a, miss, a slight error there. It's actually the other way around. Uh, so it's, it is 1-1 one, one between these teams at the moment in their game ones at least. Plenty of magic still to play here though. Yeah, so Zach opted to use the Ixalan's binding on the Dire Fleet Captain, which is a little bit interesting as the Captain's not too much of an issue right now. Zach still has plenty of life buffer and a few blockers, but, uh, I mean, if Paulo just randomly has a few other Dire Fleet Captains, he won't be able to cast them anymore because of the binding's um, text. Yeah, if you have to pick one of those cards that you don't want to see more of, I think that it's pretty safe to say that the Captain uh, is in charge, yeah. appropriately <laughs> enough. Another double block here from Zach Hill. Basically, he just needs to hope that uh, Palo Vittor Dame de Rosa, oh, he finds the double black finally. And the plank being walked by Zach Hill's uh, big vampire there. You'd have thought the vampire would be fine. He walks to the end of the plank, starts flying, and then just flies away. But apparently, that's not how these things work. Yeah, we actually have a very close game now, Zach. Just off the top deck now, doesn't look like he has anything. He's holding back the Skyblade of the Legion as it does stop the Dire Fleet Hoarder. So, you know, this is still anybody's game. Pretty telling that Zach might have drawn something if he's opting to attack now. Yeah, both these players with lands in play, cards in hand, uh, we could really see it go whichever way you want. 
All right, well, Zach's the only person with flyers, it would appear, so that, that's probably going to be something that's relevant. Also gets in just a little extra ping of damage through there. And even better, gains Zach one as well. Yeah, Sky March Bloodletter, the 2-2 two -two flyer for three with a little bit of extra value, uh, just eating one point of your opponent's life when it comes into play, and you get to gain that life. Not quite a two-turn clock for Zach, but he doesn't need much to make it so. As it stands, though, he's just winning this race very handily. And I like this, I like this play from Zach. He knows it's not a two-turn clock, so he might as well hold back the 1-3 flyer, which is stopping effectively two damage. Better safe than sorry. I mean, there's so many different ways that uh, any deck with red and black in can represent extra damage. Pirates Cutlass coming along okay. here. That was one of them. Uh, plus two, plus one. When it comes into play, it immediately gets equipped to that pirate in play. So there's a 4-2 four a four attacking in here. Yeah, that was a great draw for Paulo. He's able to get in for four here. I would imagine Zach just takes the damage as he wants to preserve that 1-3 as as long as he gets one attack in with both these creatures, he'll have a two-turn clock. Super close, though. So many cards that Palo Vittor Damodorosa could draw in order to close this game out. Yeah, and it, it, this is a really interesting spot because if Zach wants to go for it, he attacks with both here. Paulo only has four damage on the backswing, which doesn't kill Zach, and then the blood letter will be lethal by itself the following turn. But he might want to play conservative. He might be a little bit scared of what Paulo could have. And if he ends up holding back a creature, but Paulo doesn't draw anything, then Zach's going to get punished. Yeah, I mean, five life on both sides of things means that this is far more interesting than if we had even one point of life differently uh, at any point in this game, because if Zach Hill was at four, then unfriendly fire on its own would be enough to close things out, whereas an unfriendly fire from this exact spot is a little messier in terms of closing things. Do you want to use it on a creature to clear a path? Do you want to uh, work things a little differently? Zach decides that he's going to get busy living and hopefully get uh, Paolo busy dying. Yeah. Swings in with everybody. Love this play from Zach. You play to win and not play to survive. And, you know, it looks like he correctly read the line and finish, uh, finished that one off. So it looks on the face of things like it's a, a sweep in game ones for uh, DeRosa, Froelich, and Stark. Actually, we know that Ben Stark did drop his first game to Hayden Bedsall. That's not quite as one-sided as it first appears. Uh, but the wonders of Time Walk Magic, we get to jump across and immediately see Eric Froelich against Ryan Sachs. Red Blue, uh, liking the saga, lands there from Ryan Sachs, who kicking things off with his Pirates theme. Uh, on the other side of it, we've got green, white uh, dinosaurs. And kind of cool on both sides of things here, we're getting a chance to see the fact that both of these tribes, effectively, they've got a bunch of different color combinations they can choose to use. Yes. I'm glad you uh, mentioned Ryan's lands. I was going to say something if you didn't love those saga <laughs> lands. Looks like green, white dinos for Eric. Raptor Companion trading with that Fathom Fleet. I think that's just a good trade. Two drops away. Range, uh, yeah, Ranging Raptor is just super annoying as far as three drops are concerned. Yeah, it's one of those things that if you have a way of uh, actually killing it, chances are uh, there's going to be a parting shot of fetching up a land for uh, Froelich there, thanks to the Enrage trigger. On the other side of things, though, I kind of like the Lightning Rig crew for Ryan Sachs's pirate deck. It means that he gets a point of damage every time that he plays a... Oh, baby every time he plays a pirate, but this time he has a dinosaur and it's <laughs> one of the most potent dinosaurs in the entire set, I would say. At Uncommon, that charging monstrosaur, 5-5, five five, trample, haste. It's been called the reality smash of the format because you kind of want to try to find a way of playing it even if you're splashing it in limited, but conveniently enough here, the mana works out just fine for Ryan Sachs as he's trying to turn things around a game down already to Eric Froelich. Yeah, charging monstrosaur, just an absurd magic card. I think we're going to see a lot of players splashing for it if if the red player doesn't already have it in their deck. Uh, I mean, 5-5, five, five, trample, haste for five, and only one mana symbol. This being, you know, a red one, of course. It's just super powerful. Ixalan's binding, dealing with that charging monster saw, and if, in the unlikely chance that Ryan Sachs had more copies of it, well, they don't get to get cast by him anymore. Uh, Eric Froelich, he took his hit, but you know what? The life tiles are 13 to 13, and I would say that Froelich has the slightly better board here. Mm -hmm. So, follow-up plays from Ryan. Gets a chance to uh, kick things off. So, funny thing here, Ryan was actually attacking with the, with the rig crew because it's not a defender, and now he was able to trigger raid and uh, loot with that shipwreck looter. 
you'll notice that we've sped things up a little bit here. We want to make sure that we can bring you as many games as possible, and that means that through the wonders of Time Walk Magic, we do get to go in turbo mode a little bit here. We want to try and show you as much as possible because things closing out a little bit here in this round. Oh, baby. Supreme value from Eric's side. Oh. So the Raging Swordtooth enters the battlefield, deals one damage to each creature. Yep. Eric has two enraged creatures. He has the Ravenous Dagger Tooth, and he has the Ranging Raptor. So he's going to get to fetch up on another land, gain two life, kill one of Ryan's creatures, which was a 2-1. And, and then he's got a 5-5 five, five Trampler on the battlefield. And then he's got a 5-5 five, five Trampler while still attacking in for a few points of damage. I am a fan. Oh. Yeah, not too many ways that you're naturally choosing to damage your own creatures with Enrage, but that one definitely counts. So Ryan Sachs on the back foot here, kind of hoping to find a way of getting things going. But right now, it seems like the dinosaurs of Eric Froelich, he's the full three colors of dinosaurs. Uh, that meaning that we know that he's going to have a ton of super powerful uh, dinosaurs coming because once you're three colors, that suggests that there's some goodies involved. Yeah, oh. We've already seen one goodie. I wonder if Eric is playing Gashath. Ooh, I would, I would love to see, you know, the biggest of all of the avatars. <laughs> Take a look at uh, Eric's deck list real quick, see if he actually has one or not. Oh, Pounce, so, so good when you have Enrage going on. Those ranging raptors, again, getting to search up a land while dealing with uh, a creature on Ryan Sachs' side of the battlefield. Lovely plays here for Eric Frollo. This is how you want to start your round one, just beating down your opponent, body and head, all these dinosaurs coming in here, and Sax's life total getting a little little low here. And how many extra lands? I believe that's three extra lands that uh, Ranging Raptors has been able to search out for Eric Froelich. Premium three drop, honestly. Yeah, the, the fight synergies with Enrage, so, so potent. Ooh, Exali's Keeper here also doing an amazing job at kind of just pressuring Ryan as Eric can just leave up eight mana, give a creature plus five, plus five, and trample. Yeah, big problems for Ryan Sachs here. He's on six life. I don't think that there's a way. Uh, in, and certainly, he's dead, on, he's dead on the desk here uh, in terms of the creatures on the battlefield. He needs a big spell. What's he got going on? Nope, there's the handshake. So the first match of our grand match, if you will, completed there. Eric Froelich picking up the win. But we're in time walk mode, so we're just going to give you a quick update of how things are going, because we don't have a chance to bring you literally everything that's going on. While uh, Eric Froelich was able to pick up his first uh, match in this series, uh, on the other side of things, Hayden Bedzel was able to pick up a match as well, which means that it all ultimately came down to Palavitor, Damodarosa, and Zach Hill. Now, of course, we saw game one where Zach Hill's deck, which he himself described as being full of gasoline, was able to take things down against Palo Vitor Dama de Rosa. Uh, in terms of how things went for the second game, well, it turns out it's more or less more of the same. Uh, we, did, we did have a win there for Zach Hill, so a powerhouse team losing in the first round. Be back for more magic here from Grand Prix Providence soon enough here after these messages. <laughs> 